Hi guys, good morning. Good morning, Berlin. Um, so thanks for coming to um, our talk about the regulatory um, frameworks in the US and in Europe. So uh, it's my, at least my talk is gonna be a little bit sad, um, like all these uncertainties, but hopefully we can have some fun with it. Uh, so I'll get started. Um, so how we test, I'm sure a lot of you guys are already familiar with the how we test, but to start on the same page, um, this is the point of departure um, for understanding what are the elements for determining whether uh, something is a security or an investment contract in the US. So we have something called um, SEC versus um, JW, uh, WJ Howey, uh, which is a 1946 Supreme Court ruling that was interpreting on the 1933 Securities Act and said, well, the Securities Act hasn't really defined what is an investment contract, and so the court stepped in and defined those elements. So as you may be familiar, um, four primary elements. Is there an investment of money into a common enterprise with an expectation of profits primarily through the efforts of third parties? Um, so we'll get into a little bit more of the nuance later. Um, you know, through the whole exercise of, of trying to apply how we test in the context of ICOs, um, the best chance you might have of being a little bit creative with the, with the legal argument is probably gonna be that last prong, um, the efforts of, of others, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. Um, and I think it's also worth, um, I don't know what people's backgrounds are here. Uh, if you come from a civil law jurisdiction or a common law, uh, there's uh, big differences in terms of how those legal um, uh, institutions work, uh, and the US legal institution in particular can be very, very frustrating um, for non-US lawyers. So just a, a little bit of how the different entities work. So you have the legislature, so like 1933 Securities Act, right? That's a piece of legislature passed by both houses of Congress. Then you have the courts um, that make judge-made law, and they can interpret legislation and then you have the um, executive branch of the government. Um, so you have enforcement bodies like the SEC, which is this uh, Securities Exchange Commission, that can, that can interpret the law as well and make their own enforcement rules. And those can also be challenged in court to settle those issues if the, um, if the legislature does not um, settle it through, um, through actual new legislation. So there hasn't been any like landmark litigation um, on how we in the context of ICOs, but the SEC has published several key analysis through enforcement action letters on their interpretation of how we um, in the context of ICOs. So uh, courts, if it gets litigated, courts can give deference to um, the SEC, but they're not bound by that. So uh, courts always have kind of de novo jurisdiction and how they interpret um, legislation. So the two big pieces of SEC uh, interpretation of Howey um, was uh, the Dow report back in July 2017. So that was not an enforcement action letter. Um, that was them saying, hey, you know, let's take an easy case of the Dow. Yeah, it's a security. And then here's our first um, glimpse of our thinking in terms of the Howey test. And then uh, the Munchy enforcement action letter back in December 2017 came out and said, wait a minute, don't pull the wool over my eyes, you can't say this is some ecosystem token, but you're actually just selling this to make money. So those are kind of the key pieces of understanding how things work. Um, it's a frustrating process, perhaps for, for some, in terms of the uncertainty of how the law moves, but it is ironically, if not fittingly, a decentralized form of, of lawmaking. So we have the different bodies of... Um, of, of the government working through the analysis. Um, so uh, utility tokens basically don't exist in the US. And anyone who thinks that they do uh, probably should be sued for malpractice. Um, so you know, for me, I always think, well, what exactly is utility? So anything can have a utility. You can package anything to have a utility. But if it still has the hallmarks of a security, it's a security. Um, and the SAFT, which um, was a short-lived um, invention by some creative lawyers um, to say, hey, we're going to be really clever about utility tokens. Um, SAFT stands for Simple Agreement for Future Tokens, 
where they said, okay, it's kind of like magical thinking. Um, it, at the inception of a project, when we raise the money, we will call that a security. It is a security because the platform does not yet exist. There is um, no such utility as of the time of fundraising. So we'll do something called a Reg Deep, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, but once the token launches on a live platform and it's operational and there's utility, magically, by operation of utility, something that was a security becomes not a security. So that's a very bizarre form of magical thinking, which, um, you know, it's, it doesn't work. Um, so if anyone is trying to sell you SAFs in the US, you should probably report them to the Bar Association or the SEC. Um, so the SEC, when they, you know, especially in, in the Munchie Enforcement Action Letter, they have come out and said, we are gonna be looking at form over substance. We are looking at the economic realities of a transaction so you can be clever with, you know, magical thinking like SAFs, but if it's really gonna, if it really smells like a security, like, an, in, like a risk capital, like an investment of money, and people are looking to, to make money off that, then that's a security. And therefore, there should be certain uh, protections for the investors. There should be uh, disclosures. There should be um, other requirements under the um, Securities Act. And so this idea of uh, utility tokens, sometimes people call it um, consumer tokens, again, because they're trying to be clever and say, well, utility is out of vogue. Let's call these consumer tokens um, Indiegogo, which, was, which is a crowdfunding platform, was trying to pivot into this area um, with uh, consumer tokens. They, they had to pull their sale of, of, of a consumer pro, um, token recently. Um, so what does that mean? Um, the going assumption is that basically all projects they're raising, um, they're going to be securities. So that's kind of the going assumption in the U.S. Um, and for me, it's not a, this isn't a legal test, um, but for me in particular, you really have to think about what is the economic rationale for a token, right? So um, if it's a DAP, I mean, why doesn't that look like any other form of um, equity investment? Why do you really need to have a token? Uh, whereas if it's a public blockchain, then there, there might be some good rationale there where you need um, an endogenous form of economic incentive for uh, folks to be uh, block producers to secure the ledger, right? Uh, but even then, at least in the assumption, it still may not be uh, consider something other than a security um, because there is still um, the risk capital um, that you're using to incentivize people. There is still a central uh, or centralized parties that are promoters or issuers of the token that have significant control over the development of the project and that are using your money um, to, to uh, invest in the development of that project, right? So, so these are kind of all the hallmarks of what venture capital looks like. And that also means that um, doing free airdrops or bounties does not get you out of the um, securities doghouse. That's still a securities offering. You're just you're getting you're getting some benefit in return, um, and so it still counts. And so you can't just think that you cannot register um, the offering if you are giving it away for free. So now you're starting to see the rise of something called STOs. They stand for security token offerings. Um, this can also include non-blockchain projects that want to raise equity um, through this new kind of crowdfunding mechanism, um, issuing their equity as a crypto asset on the blockchain, um, which will now also require to have um, broker-dealer compliant pr platforms to trade these types of security tokens. So that's another thing that the SEC is going after is all the intermediaries that are not registered to be exchanges or to be uh, broker-dealer alternative trading systems. So now there's a lot of um, efforts in this area to have compliant trading systems for security tokens. Um, so how do you actually have a security offer offering in the US? The most popular one is going to be Regulation D. It's for rich people only. Um, so an incredible investor, um, you make $200,000 a year in salary or have one million in net access, excluding your primary house. And it is a exemption to registration. So the securities are restricted and they're, it's supposed to be a private sale, meaning they're there is um, not free exchange or resale of, of your um, securities. 
Uh, so under Rule 144 Safe Harbor, if you season your, um, your securities for 12 months, then you can, then it's a presumption that you didn't buy the securities in the first place to be an underwriter or reseller. So then if you wait 12 months, you can then uh, resell your, your uh, securities. So there are two flavors of Reg D. Traditionally, it's 506B, meaning that it's private solicitation only. You cannot go out and openly advertise um, that you're offering um, an investment opportunity. With the JOBS Act, um, there is now a 506C, which allows public so solicitation for um, investments, but now there's a shift in the burden to the issuer to actually prove that the investors are accredited. So until the whole ICO boom, not a lot of people were using 506C because they were afraid of what the actual liabilities were for, um, for actually ensuring that your investors are accredited, but the ICOs have made 506C really popular because everyone wants to tell the world, hey, come buy my tokens. Um, the other option is Regulation A+, which also came out of the JOBS Act. Um, so you can offer a, um, to non-accredited investors under Reg A+, but there's a number of caveats. So there is an amount of, of capital that's, that's capped, um, but more tr problematic, perhaps, is, is that um, you have to go through SEC approval for this, whereas you don't have to do that with Reg D. So Reg D, you could go out there, you don't need to talk to the SEC, you can go and solicit for your investors, you file a Form D to put the regulators on notice of what you're doing, but you don't actually have to get the SEC to approve your offering docs as you do with a Regulation A+. So a Reg A+, is effectively a kind of a public offering, um, but it's for smaller um, issuance, and there are also some restrictions on resale. Um, so you think, great, I'm going to do like Reg D or Reg A+. But then there's something called the 1934 Exchange Act. So if you've got assets greater than 10 million and more than 2,000 shareholders on record, now you're a public reporting company. And if you have more than 500 non-accredited investors, that also makes you a public reporting company. And that means um, it's really expensive because now you've got to file audited financials. So you're going to spend maybe a million or two to be a compliant reporting company under the 34 Exchange Act, which obviously doesn't really work if you're a tiny startup company and you know a million or two is probably your entire budget for the year. So um, more sad news, um, death and taxes. The IRS um, currently treats um, cryptocurrencies as property, meaning that every time you have a transaction, it is technically a taxable event. Even if you are not um, exiting out into fiat, you're technically liable to pay taxes in, you know, good old U.S. dollars. Um, and the IRS will have enforcement by way of audit. So they'll come after you and make your life miserable um, if you are doing significant amounts of crypto trading. Um, and more sad news, um, turf wars amongst all the different regulators, um, because it's, it's a bit of a, you know, the nature of digital assets that they show different properties that they don't quite fit into one box or another means that different uh, regulators want to have a piece of the pie. So you might think, oh, I'm not a security, I'm in the clear, but that may not be the case. So you have something called FinCEN, which is the financial um, crimes enforcement um, uh, network that enforces the Bank Secrecy Act. So these are all your KYC and AML requirements. So if you are um, an issuer of a, of a crypto asset, um, where the tokens are exchangeable for other tokens, even tokens that are not necessarily, um, you know, representing cash, but they can they serve as a substitute for money. Then you could be considered as a money services business. So you'll need a, a money transmitter license. You could possibly be both a security and a currency for purposes of FinCEN jurisdiction. So that's um, kind of a headache. Um, then there's the CFTC. A lot of people are trying to say that they're commodities. Um, so Judge Weinstein um, in the Eastern District of New York, who is a 
influential federal judge has ruled in a case saying that Bitcoin and Litecoin are commodities. And generally, people want to be like commodities, not securities, because commodities tend to be less regulated. So the CFTC, which is the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, it has jurisdiction over uh, futures options and derivatives. So for example, if you have a Bitcoin futures. Um, but normally, they don't regulate um, spot transactions of currencies, including virtual currencies, that don't involve any kind of margin leverage or, or some kind of financing. So people want to kind of be in the commodities bucket. And on top of that, you have, um, don't forget, you have all 50 states that have their own securities and, and money services regulations. So, you know, federalism, right? It's a form of decentralization. So, you, you know, if you're, I guess, a diehard decentralist, maybe you should love having all these different uh, jurisdictional uh, regimes. And, okay, so it's been all very sad so far in this discussion, but there's a glimmer of hope. Um, earlier in the summer, um, uh, uh, Director Hinman from the Corporate Finance Division of the SEC gave uh, a speech um, that gave some people hope that if you're perhaps a public blockchain, um, like, like Ethereum, um, that has an endogenous, endogenous need for a, a token, then perhaps you have a chance of escaping the securities uh, jaws of the SEC. Um, but um, a bit of nuance there. Um, so first, a couple of first principles that um, him and touched upon in his speech. Um, so anything can be a security depending on how it is actually packaged. So the thing itself, the object itself, may not be a security um, in the same way that your house is not a security, but mortgage-backed securities are. Um, so a token by itself may not necessarily be a security. It could be a piece of code, but how you package it and how you sell it can turn that into a security because it has all those how we test hallmarks. Um, and then the most interesting point um, that he made that got people really excited um, is that decentralization and predominantly around the governance of decentralization is an important element in reducing the information asymmetry between principles and agents. So that's one of the primary rationales for why we have security laws. Um, security laws are there to protect um, investors who are entrusting their money to uh, a principal, right, to the founder. So it, there's a bit of that um, fiduciary type of relationship between principal and agent. Um, but if the project becomes sufficiently decentralized, we're reducing those information asymmetries and we're reducing and dissipating the, the role of a centralized um, body or entity that has kind of outsized influence in terms of how a project gets developed, in terms of how they extract economic value from a project, right? So that's one of the things that Hibben said. It's like, well, we look at Ethereum and it's, you know, it doesn't really look like your typical uh, company whereby you have a board of directors and a management team that's really principally responsible for driving the project. You can't really identify that uh, central entity anymore. And so there's a possibility that when you start a project, naturally it's gonna be more centralized because you have a core team of uh, promoters. Uh, but over time, if there's the sufficient market adoption, maybe if there's the right um, governance mechanisms that en enable people to permissionlessly participate, you start dissipating those, um, those traditional contours of what a traditional company looks like. Um, so uh, that becomes really interesting, but it doesn't mean that just because you're a public blockchain, you are not a security from the outset, because again, the test is looking at, um, it goes to the, to the last prong of the Howey test, right? Is there, primarily a reliance on um, other people to make your investment happen for you, or are you now able to actively participate and we can't really identify uh, a central body that's predominantly responsible. Um, so, so the rationale of going from, uh, going from a security at the outset to not being a, a security over time because of the decentralization 
it's, it's a subtle difference from the SAF reasoning, which is based on, well, is it operational or not? So um, just to point that out. Um, so, how do we, so how do we get to a legal test, though, around is there sufficient decentralization? So that's really a, the difficult question. So we've got a nice academic articulation of why decentralization or how decentralization plays a role in the securities law analysis, but we're still in like the middle of the ocean trying to figure out, well then, how do you test for that, right? Um, so that's probably still gonna require a significant amount of, of legislative work and, and rulemaking. Um, but one thing that's really interesting um, that I spent a lot of time talking to David Otto about, so David is the um, general counsel for our chain, and our chain is a um, and so his rationale is because of the cooperative nature of, um, of, that, of that structure, it requires all the participants to be active, to be principals rather than agents, right? So how, do we, how have we financed and, and, and governed public commons? Um, so we have now the new internet commons, um, but if we look at other analogies, you know, farmers were trying to get together and finance and govern literally a public commons, right, a physical commons or public utilities, right, and so they used the cooperative model as a means to, to um, incentivize folks to take care of the, of the commons together and to benefit together from that. Um, so can we retool this um, legal structure for the purposes of uh, the, the web commons? Um, and so our chains are cooperative and there's a number of others that are looking to become cooperatives like DAPUP, which is building out MakerDAO. And again, the rationale goes back to if you are a cooperative member, you are a principal, you are actively engaged in the governance and the development of this common enterprise and not primarily through the efforts of others. Um, so again, it'll be yet, um, we have yet to see how the cooperative model will play out legally. David told me that he talked to the SEC about it and they weren't giving him too much pushback. So the, the effort is on perhaps lawyers to, to push forth the rationale for the cooperative model. But the SEC will always look at substance over form. So it will come down to how is that cooperative actually functioning? How is the governance actually working? How much sufficient you know, decentralization there is in that project. Um, so that will be something to be seen. Um, and also looking at new funding models, um, which is something that um, Director Hinman uh, alluded to in his speech as well, is that s projects are now taking the approach, okay, when at the outset when we're raising money, we will raise money perhaps in more traditional ways, like a traditional startup through um, Reg D filings for equity investments, and when we're ready to stand up the network, because there's now sufficient decentralization, we can then have a new uh, economic entity, like, which, is, which are the tokens, and so people are experimenting with these new um, models. And in terms of the way forward, so we do need probably legislative frameworks um, to help um, settle some of these questions around what's the proper legal test, do we accept um, decentralization as a legal um, primitive or as a legal uh, principle, and how do we test for that? So is that something that the, you want to fight out in the courts, or is that something that we should have some kind of legislative framework, because that will also resolve a lot of the competing jurisdiction between different regulators? Um, how do we think about creating a, a separate category for financing a public web infrastructure versus dApps? In my view, I think dApps probably should be security tokens, and there can still be a lot of innovation um, with security tokens, you know, using smart contracts to automatically enforce the securities law. So for example, your Rule 144 seasoning period, um, your accredited investor status, and so forth. Um, elephant in the room is, of course, do we broaden the scope of crowdfunding and what it means to be accredited or non-accredited investor, democratize those investment opportunities. Um, the level of public or the number or the quantum of public equities in the market today is at historical lows. Companies do not want to IPO. And that's a real problem actually for mainstream investors because that means we have fewer opportunities to invest 
in, um, in good uh, investment opportunities. So I was watching um, a interview with the SEC chairman, Jay Clayton. So the interview started with, what are ICOs? And he was like, they're all, you know, securities are all illegal. And then the, the interview ended with, well, you know, there's the, the public markets are at historical lows in terms of the number of opportunities for mainstream investors. But the journalist didn't ask, well, there's a connection there in terms of why people want to invest in ICOs because they don't have access to investment opportunities because there's a decline of the number of public equities available. Um, so there's, there's a real question there in terms of how do we think about broadening the scope of what we allow people to invest in. And finally, I think there's, there's, it's also important for that we have legislation for data and identity self-sovereignty, you know, creating new labor laws around how we create um, data production for the digital economy. So if we can get all of these things, then we have some hope for a decentralized future. I'll leave you with that. Come find me on the internet. My name is uh, Nina Siedler. I'm a partner with uh, DWF here in Berlin. Um, I come from the uh, finance uh, area. I worked with you know, structured finance, um, corporate bonds, uh, and, and all sorts on the debt side of the balance sheet before stepping into the blockchain area. Um, I was actually part of the group that uh, formed the uh, Bundesblock last year, the German Blockchain Association, and had the finance board there. And we issued a token recognition paper to go over yet in uh, February, which you can download on the Bundesblock page. <laughs> uh, which, uh, concentrates on German law and EU law as far as applicable in Germany, and we're currently broadening this to further EU countries, and we hope that we will find an update um, in autumn this year to further jurisdictions. And what we could actually see is um, that um, the, the principal ideas which are described in that paper um, really arrived also with the regulators. So in the meantime, all the cases we have in front of BaFin, the German regulator, confirmed the views that we expressed in, in that paper. So we are actually pretty happy on our end. But prior to really diving into the regulation topic, I would like to address some general points when you start planning anything involving tokens and selling tokens, whether this is uh, during an ICO for pure funding purposes, or uh, it might also be uh, within an ongoing business. You, you always need to take your time. Uh, the big problem in the blockchain scene, which we see, is that everyone wants to do everything tomorrow. That simply doesn't work. You need time to structure the whole thing. You need to work through you know, the legal considerations, uh, figure out whether you need a license or a prospectus, which will take, again, uh, quite some time to achieve. And uh, don't miss tax structuring. That's a really dangerous thing. I'm sure we'll see a lot of insolvencies of blockchain startups in three years' time when the uh, tax authorities come and check the books. So that's another important thing. Uh, when uh, new clients come to us, we usually immediately say, okay, start discussing with the tax guys before, and when you figure it out, the proper structure, then we, you know, on the legal side, can start documenting it. But it doesn't make any sense to turn that around that we start documenting something and then, you know, the, the tax people in the end say, well, that's all rubbish, uh, that will end, you know, that will result in extremely high tax burden for the project. <coughs> and what is in ICO cases of utmost importance is that you, first of all, sort out the team tokens. Everyone is always believing that you can simply give away team tokens in the beginning for nothing. That doesn't work on the tech side. If the people receiving those team tokens are employees, then you know this is part of their wage, their income, and needs to be taxed. That's typically not very good. So the better 
way maybe to handle these things is to actually sell the tokens at a very early stage for a very low price. But please discuss with your tax advisors how to set that price because it might be challenged later on by the um, tax authorities. Um, and then you need to be able to argue why there is a difference in price uh, for the first true third-party sale, which typically is a private pre-sale phase. And unfortunately, that's typically the point in time when people reach out to us, right? Uh, and then you are already into trouble. You usually need to then delay the private pre-sale to a later stage because you first of all need to do the team token sale. And if you don't want to do that at the, at the same price as for the private pre-sale, you need some milestones in between, something that you can argue with what, why there is a price difference between the team token sale and the private um, token sale. Um, and that can easily delay things. So uh, typical milestones we're seeing in that area are, for example, that you reached um, regulatory confirmation by the re responsible bodies, that you partnered up with further institutions or companies, got further well-known advisors, developed you know, your, your tax tech further on. But there needs to be something objective between those sales if you want to differ in price. Then, um, typically, uh, utility tokens, which we actually accept in, in the EU, different from the um, US, but I come to explain what exactly we understand under utility tokens later. Um, so utility tokens typically do not raise that many questions with regard to tax, but you keep, have to uh, keep VAT in mind, right? Because it's, uh, you know, if you sell a voucher, um, then in the end, if it's, uh, if it's a voucher which you can use for multiple purposes, VAT will come up at the time when the voucher is actually redeemed. If it has only one single purpose, VAT is due immediately. But that, that stuff you have to keep in mind. And on the cryptocurrency side, you have to deal uh, with a profit tax problem, right? Because if you're selling a cryptocurrency, you're increasing the asset side of your balance sheet immensely if you're successful, but nothing is happening on your debt side. So that immediately creates income, which is then taxed according to the location where you are. And that's typically in Germany a huge problem because income tax is roughly about 35%. Uh, and nobody wants to you know, hand on 35% of the ICO income uh, in the first year to the tax authority. So that's a topic to deal with beforehand. And then the third thing which will take your time is the multi-jurisdictional challenge. There is, as Fanny already mentioned, there is no blockchain startup who only wants to do their token sales or offer their uh, products in one jurisdiction. Any jurisdiction you touch, you need to check separately. There is no way around it. Unfortunately, I always like to say law is already decentralized and I personally think that it is a good thing. If we would only have one law across the globe, this would be terrifying. You would have no choice. So we all need to deal with this. Um, and that's, that's, that's a costly exercise and uh, actually I don't really, I, I don't know any project which had been able to go globally uh, at once you will need to make your choices which markets you approach and then start from there and, and grow. That's typically what any kind of, of company um, historically did. Okay. <coughs> That's just a quick overview. And um, uh, I need to put in a disclaimer here. I'm German licensed only. Uh, so I took France, Italy, and UK from uh, a presentation I did together with a couple of my DWF colleagues last year, um, just to maybe show a little bit the, the difference in the civil law and, and regulatory um, approaches. Uh, and you can also tell, you know, by reading no security per se, that there is some, some vagueness um, in... Um, in the description I'm, I'm giving here. Just to show that even within the EU, 
topics are not dealt with in an identical manner. So you couldn't say, you know, I'm checking on one jurisdiction and, and covered the whole EU. Okay, let's take a closer look at what is our European Howey test, so to speak. Um, these points there um, are the requirements set by MIFID for a security according to MIFID, and that applies especially for the prospectus regulation. So whenever you've got a security token, a security according to, to those points, um, then you will be required to issue a prospectus unless you go for one of the exemptions available. <coughs> and there's maybe one difference to the US. We don't say you can sell to accredited investors by checking if they are actually wealthy. It's a little bit simpler in the EU because the typical uh, exemption for prospectors is that you set a minimum investment amount. And if you fall under the uh, security prospectus regime, that's currently 100,000. So you don't need to check how rich the guy is who's investing, but you simply say, I'm not selling below that threshold. That is one, one of the typical exemptions available in that area. But let's take a closer look. Um, so a security according to MIFID requires that the instrument is transferable and negotiable. I guess, you know, that's basically the case with any kind of token we're talking about. Um, and it must be so on, on a capital market. Bafin said in their publication in spring this year that they basically uh, recognize any kind of crypto exchange as capital market. So they ticked the box more or less blankly for anything. We, in our working group uh, within Bundesblock, we put a little question mark to that because you could imagine that there might be in the future even an exchange which only concentrates on vouchers uh, playing in the pure economy area, but not in the financial section. But for the time being, I guess uh, you simply need to assume that any kind of token uh, which is not restricted, which does not restrict the transferability, will, um, will uh, meet those first three requirements. Then standardized, I guess that's also something that maybe if you think of um, CryptoKitties, that doesn't really fit. But other than those rather rare tokens, um, any kind of token is typically standardized in the meaning that you can simply order a number and don't need to deliver any further specifications for it. Um, then what's interesting is the point, no instrument of payment. That is typically anything like cash, um, checks, uh, and the like. And the question is whether if you can argue that you're a, crypto, a cryptocurrency, in the meaning of virtual currency, um, as this term is defined uh, in the U new EU anti-money laundering directive, um, if that would get you out of the security token definition. Um, that, is, that is still open, um, so I wouldn't rely on that, but I see it looming uh, in the future that um, that might be a criteria to move your token from the security token into the cryptocurrency area, we'll see. And those one, two, three, four, five first requirements uh, is basically all the MIFID states, right? So those five are clear. Um, and then, you know, in, in the legal discussion, we said this is way too broad. Because if you end there, then, you know, any kind of token would obviously be a security. But that's not our understanding in the EU so far. There is a list of examples added to the MIFID uh, security definition, which contains especially shares and bonds and derivatives relating to those. And that's where we came to the conclusion, say, in addition to those express requirements, we must also require that the instrument uh, represented by that token is comparable to the typical equity and debt instruments we are used to. 
Um, and we are very happy to see in the latest um, publication of BaFin, the German regulator from just August, um, that, they, um, that they list this as a requirement now as well. So that seems to be agreed that we need to draw a line between a financial instrument which basically promise you a financial return from the issuer, not from a network, but from the issuer, from the one who is selling the token, um, opposite to what we then call utility token, that's all what's left over, you know, when, when you uh, look through the security uh, definition, uh, and it's no security token, it is no cryptocurrency in the sense of the virtual currency, that it's basically a, a means of payment. Everything that's left over, that's what we call utility token. Um, so what, what, what is that? Typically it's a voucher for a service or a product, um, but it could also be a club membership, uh, maybe you know Iconic, that's a club membership model, um, that does not promise a, a direct financial return um, like a share in a company would do because then you need to share the, the profits of the company between the shareholders or like a bond or like a loan uh, would do. So we do see an area that is outside of financial regulation and we have tons of cases discussed with BaFin so far. Actually, we bring each and any case, even if, if we are 100% sure in which box to put it, we bring each and any case in front of BaFin just to keep the discussion going and to get you know, to, to more detailed terms with them. And um, that we, we've got a couple of utility tokens which, which were formally agreed to be outside of the financial regulatory area. So I think that's a, that's a main difference from the US. If you fall under the security token, securities definition, according to MIFID, then you will, generally speaking, um, need to issue a prospectus. But the good thing is, um, this prospectus can be passported across the whole EU. So you've got one prospectus, and and you're done with it. Um, additionally, you might find um, in in single jurisdictions further prospectus requirements. For example, we in Germany have, um, in addition to the prospectus, um, securities prospectus law, we have another law, the law on other investments, Vermögensanlagegesetz, which catches especially the very relevant uh, profit participations, which are um, used fairly often in, in the blockchain scene. And on that end, we are still discussing with the BaFin if a typical profit participation, which had not been tradable as such on capital markets so far, but become tradable now when it's tokenized, if we then need to issue a German-specific prospectus on this or rather whether we can actually make the EU prospectus. So I guess that will be answered, I think, during the course of September sometime, finally. Okay, maybe um, I don't want to repeat the Howey test. I just want to point out where the differences are. So the question whether there is an expectation of profits um, from the investment is not of relevance as far as this only relates to trading profits. So if you expect the token to rise in value, that as such is no reason um, to put it into the security token box on our end. Right? There is a lot of stuff out there. Think of art, think of real estate, of old timers, uh, you name it, uh, which people basically buy because they believe that the value will increase. But those things do not turn to be securities um, just because of that. So that is not really um, that relevant. Um, same with that the profit comes from the efforts of a promoter or a third party. Um, I think there is especially a difference between the argument, you know, if you sell something and promise that the network is such, that the platform, that the community will lead to the rise of um, the value of that token, um, that, that's not really an argument that, that we're discussing here on our end. Unfortunately, 
Switzerland, in the meantime, moved also towards the US view of things. Um, that's a table that I copied out of a publication of the Swiss FINMA. Um, and I understand from my Switzerland colleagues um, that was without any need, right? So to implement those thoughts into Swiss law, um, there had been actually no real basis for that. But nevertheless, the regulator uh, went into that direction. And uh, we would be very happy if the EU regulators uh, stay away from that. Because I think that our uh, differentiation is much clearer. Um, and something that's easier to handle than these very soft criteria uh, and especially expectation of profits from the investment. I understand that this is the investor view, right? It's not like the issuer's view of things. So, you know, how can you as issuer ever always know, you know, what the expectation is? Obviously, you can drive certain expectations through marketing, but um, other than that, it's really difficult um, to tell in advance what, what precisely uh, a third party expects. Yeah, um, I already mentioned um, prospectus requirements. Um, again, disclaimer, France, Italy, UK, it's taken from a presentation uh, end of last year, so it might not be up to date, uh, especially with that turn um, that we now seem to acknowledge that uh, certain instruments like profit participations, which had been outside of the typical uh, MIFID security definition so far because they had not been tradable, turn, may turn into a MIFID security if they are tokenized. So even France and UK, where, we, where, where this year says none, um, might very well um, be the results of the current discussions that they also fall under the Security Prospectus Act. But there is no additional uh, single jurisdiction prospectus requirement in those countries. Yeah, regulatory framework. Um, so we distinguish three phases uh, if you're doing a token sale or ICO. First question is what obligations do you have upon issuance of the token? So the first sale. Um, there might be uh, license requirements, and I will come to that with the next slide. And obviously, the prospectus requirements are already discussed. But there are, is also a regulatory framework for anything happening thereafter. Um, so especially um, the secondary market uh, tradings um, and also the services you might want to implement surrounding tokens. And there... Maybe I need to go back. I think I did not stress that. The cryptocurrencies here in between, um, any token which is meant to be used as a means of payment, uh, are actually deemed to be financial instruments under German law. No securities, but financial instruments we call a unit of account. Hence, those are regulated as well. You don't need a prospectus for those um, in the beginning, and you don't need a license for the primary issuance. But the secondary dealing with it and trading will require a license. Um, that's maybe a German, uh, a German specific way of handling this. And this actually leads that not only security tokens are regulated on secondary markets, and if you, um, you know, if you implement any kind of services surrounding that, but that also applies to cryptocurrencies. The only type of token that is outside of that are the utility tokens in the meaning as described before. Um, what kind of license uh, could you need? Um, one very important thing is that, uh, at least in Germany, you are not supposed to do any deposit taking business without having a proper full banking license. Hence, if you issue a profit participation, um, then this would be seen as um, deposit-taking business unless um, you add a deep subordination clause to that. But anything that you firmly promise to pay back will bring you into the full banking license requirement. So you must add 
you know, something to that, which makes clear that there might be circumstances under which you're not obliged to, to repay. And that is what we call deep subordination. Um, then e-money laws, um, very unfortunate. There are so many great stablecoin projects out there, but uh, in Germany we don't really get them realized. This e-money license um, requirement applies basically everywhere in the EU. Unfortunately, on the German end, our regulator is very strict with that, saying that this is um, kind of, it, it's, it's again a deposit-taking business, right? Because you promise to repay fiat uh, for your stable coin. So they are saying the requirements for getting that e-money license are nearly as high as the full banking license. Consequence is there is nearly no e-money license issued out of Germany. Um, and we're, we, we are aware of a couple of projects who move now on to Malta who seem to be very welcoming um, and, and way much um, easier to set something up there than over here. Um, another thing that is sometimes overlooked is the um, regulation of alternative investment funds. You get into that area also very quickly because uh, as soon um, as people start pooling funds to invest it together, um, you might be creating a fund already. And this starts with two investors, right? It starts basically immediately. What does it mean? Uh, alternative Investment Fund Manager Directive is also a directive on the EU level, so it basically applies all across the EU. Um, but the jurisdictions differed uh, in implementing and how they implemented it on a national level. But what applies to the whole EU is that an alternative investment fund may only be managed by a licensed manager. So it's not the company itself that needs a license, but the manager uh, managing that fund. And uh, there could be, obviously, further uh, licenses which could apply. Yeah, that's me. Um, and that's the, the broad overview I can give you for the EU. Many thanks. <laughs>